Sam Crawford turned out to be one of my closest friends. Sam was born in Wahoo, Nebraska in 1880. He was in the majors for 19 years from 1899, which I always find still amazing, to 1917, mostly with the Detroit Tigers, when he was one of baseball's outstanding power hitters. He led his league in home runs three times and still holds the all-time lifetime record for triples. He was elected to baseball's Hall of Fame in 1957. I talked to Sam in Baywood Park, California. He really lived, he had a home anyway, in Hollywood, California, because I went there to find Sam, and he wasn't there. And his wife, Mary, said, well, Sam, Sam lives here only in name. He never comes here except very rarely because he doesn't like all the people around in the big city. He doesn't like to stand on lines for anything. So Sam lives uh, north of here, and I asked her where he lived, and she wouldn't tell me. She said if she told me where he lived, he'd be mad at her because he didn't want people to know where he lived. He didn't want people bothering him. But anyway, she finally, after much cajoling, she said, well, if you go, <laughs> if you go north, it's about roughly halfway between here and San Francisco, and you can see the ocean. That's all she'd tell me. She, she was even unhappy about saying that much. So I started out, drove north, and everywhere I drove after a certain distance, when I got close to the halfway mark to San Francisco, I had stopped at real estate offices and post offices. Those were the two places I felt maybe I'd find. Every once in a while, I picked up his trail. Somebody would say, oh, that's the ball player that was here, remember? They'd say to somebody in the office, that's the ball player who was here, left that Hall of Fame card. <laughs> Sam carried around a bunch of Hall of Fame cards with him, and it would have Sam's Hall of Fame plaque on it. And Sam would leave, so to speak, his calling card at different places and chit-chat with people and say, I used to be a ball player, and, and give him the card. So every once in a while, I'd encounter somebody who had one of Sam's cards, and they say, oh, well, he was here two weeks ago, or he was here a month ago, or he was here yesterday. So I kept trailing him. So finally, I almost gave up, and I was at Baywood Park sitting in my car, thinking I'd better do a laundry. And uh, this tall, gaunt fellow passed by with a whole stack of books. And uh, I just idly watched him, and he took them into a drugstore. It was one of these places where you trade used books, paperbacks. So you, take in a, you take out a bunch, and you bring in a bunch and trade. And Sam was bringing back a bunch of paperbacks, and he was taking out another bunch. But on the way, he had some laundry with him, and he stopped in the laundromat next door to the drugstore. So I had this laundry to do, too, so I roused myself and uh, went into the laundromat and put my laundry in next to this guy's laundry, and I sat down, and I had nothing to you know, Might as well ask anybody I saw. I said, do you know anybody around here named Sam Crawford? And he said, I sure do. He says, I ought to know him, being as it's me. <laughs> That's how I met Sam Crawford. <laughs> we spent a lot of time together. Sam was a very perceptive observer of the human condition. He was a voracious reader. He read everything, including philosophy and history. And Well, one reason he didn't like cities is that too many interferences with his reading. Sam was one of my favorite people of all time. We became very close friends. Sam was a self-described nonconformist, and he and I hit it off perfectly. I can remember very well when the, the first uh, electric lights in our town, in Wahoo, on the corner, on the street corner, they'd have one, they'd one little, what they, what they call incandescent light, just one loop of wire in the globe, you know, and kind of a reddish thing. We, us kids used to go down to the corner and see, this, see the light come on, you know, at night. Yeah, that was a big deal. What did your father do? He was in the Civil War. He had a store, a general store, you know, just a little country store where they sold everything. I learned to trade there in Wahoo the hard way. Oh. Cleaning cuspidors and washing windows and mopping a floor. And then once in a while they let you lather somebody, you know, get them ready for the real barbers. And then sometime maybe there'd be a tramp come through 
wants to want a haircut or something when you get to practice on it. That's the way we learned in those days. Saturday was a big haircut. Yeah, day. that a big. Well, the farmers used to come in there Saturday night, you know, with the hair on their shoulders and manure in their hair and <laughs> hay seeds. And, you know, you work all day Saturday and up to twelve o'clock Saturday night, standing on your feet around that chair. But in a long day. That's worse than being an umpire. Oh, Lord. Was baseball a very well-known sport when you were growing up? Oh, yes. We had a team. There's always a team in Wahoo. We made a trip overland with, in a wagon with a team of horses. We had three four seats on there. And it was only about maybe 11 of us, 11, 12 of us. And we had a cook and we had a stove and a tent. And we just started out around Nebraska there. We challenged anybody, you know, it didn't make a difference. It's a baseball game. Yeah, a game, you know. One of the one of the boys had a he was a musician. He was a cornet player. When we'd come into town, you know, we could get out that cornet, you know, and he'd sound off. Coming into town, you know, and people would come around and look and see what's going on. <laughs> Ball game gonna be on. And you just had a ball drawn, ball diamond down on the prairie somewhere. But we'd drive along the country roads, you know, and if we come to a stream, well, we'd go swimming. We'd come to an apple orchard, or we'd get apples, or, you know. We'd sleep anywhere. And we lived on, what they call Round State. We used to get three pounds for a quarter. And all he could cook was. <laughs> was this round steak and gravy and bread. That's all we had. How long would you stay away from home at one time? Well, we were out several weeks. Yeah? Yeah. What yeah. was the name of this team? Wahoo. Wahoo what? Just Wahoo, that's all. And you challenged anybody to a ball game? Yeah, anybody. Did you used to win most of those games? Well, we done pretty well. Of course, it's pretty hard to win a game, you know. You go into a, a, an arrival town and try to win a game, they have their own umpires, you know. <laughs> you had to beat them to death to win, you know. Yeah, yeah, that was tough. How did you come up with Cincinnati? You started off... Uh... I started in the Canadian League. Yeah. 1899. And they sold me to Cincinnati in that fall. The same year, all this yeah, happened? All three in... leagues in one year, and I hit through over 300 in all of them. That was also your first year of organized baseball, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. You made the majors the first year. I was only 19 then, you know. Of course, you're coming into a strange situation there, altogether different, you know. Did you break right into that lineup? Yeah. Didn't they get a little resentful? Well, uh, they weren't any too friendly, you know. They didn't, uh, they didn't ask you to come up and take batting practice or anything, you know. There was a little hostility there. I could notice that, all right, but... Wasn't Dummy Hoy on that team, too? Great ball player, great outfielder. How did he communicate with his teammates? Well, he he could make a little uh, throaty noise, kind of a squawky little noise that he got out of his throat some way. I don't know how he got it. If he was going after a fly ball, I could hear this little noise. I knew he was going to take it, you see. But he was the originator or the instigator of that umpire giving the sign, the ball or strike. You see, he's up to bat, he can't hear, he can't talk. So he'd get up to bat and he'd have to look around to the, the umpire. And oh. you know, that's what started that. There was only one umpire in a big league game in those days. Yeah. One umpire. He's watching, see whether the man catches a ball or whether he feels a ball. And, Base runner cuts uh, third base by 15, 20 feet, you know, just cuts across. <laughs> and the umpire didn't see it. What are you going to do? They used to tell a story about Tim Hurst. He was an old umpire. He was a tough character, Tim Hurst. He was wise to this deal where they cut. Well, he was an umpire one time, and somebody, uh, Jake Beckley, I think it was Jake Beckley, old Cincinnati first baseman. Jake come in there, you know, made a big slide in, you know, and got up and Tim pulled him out, you're out. Then a big argument started, cussing, you know, and on. What do you mean I'm out? He said, they didn't even make a play on me. He says, you big SB, he says, you got here too quick. 
<laughs> she called him out. <laughs> he said, you got here too quick. He knew he'd cut third, you know. That's the way he stopped him. Yeah, you became an umpire too, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I umpired in a coast league. How'd you like being an umpire? Thankless job. Thankless job. Tough job. Bench over here, bench over here, and they're all watching you, you know, like a hawk trying to get something on you. It's a lonely, lonely thing, you know. Those were, those were rough and tough days, you know, in those days. Things were different. What was different? Yeah, everything was different. You didn't have the hotels. You didn't stay in the best hotels then. Ball players in those days were, were considered pretty rough, you know. They had you go in a dining room in a good hotel, it's probably as good as you can get. But they always shoved you way down in the corner somewhere, you know. There's the ball, comes the ball player, down the corner. And they're down there and couldn't get any waiters, you know. Well, did you ever hear of Kid Elberfield? Sure. With the Yankees up on the hilltop? Tough little guy, too. Well, this Elberfield, <laughs> he said, I'll get you some waiters, fellas. And they had the down in those days they had all tile floors, you know, little square tiles, you know. So he took one of the plates, he sailed it up in the air, you know, and it come down in a million pieces, you know, hit that cement tile floor, you know, scattered. He had four or five waiters around there in no time. <laughs> but that's the kind of a things that happen, you know, those things. They you they stand out in your memory, you know. So the ball players were pretty rough in those days. Yes, they were rough. They was it's spiky, you know. In time that you went around those three bases, you've been somewhere because they were stepping on your feet and they were giving you the elbow, you know, and the hip, and you know, it was a tough trip around there. <laughs> and men would play with injuries that they would not yeah, play with today. Yeah, you get spiked, uh, spiking. They're talking about Cobb spiking. Uh, Cobb never spiked anybody. If they got in the way, their own, that's their own lookout. And those infielders are supposed to take care of themselves. If they got in the way and got nicked, well, they never said anything. They'd just take a chew the back out of their mouth and slap it on there and wrap a handkerchief around and go on. They didn't think anything of it. But now, if they get a little scratch, why well, they take them to the hospital. You didn't have the kind of clubhouse training facilities that they have today, did you? No, they've got swirling baths and everything else. We you had a trainer, but you know, they just rub you down with them, put some, what they used to call, go fast on you. Take a bottle of Vaseline and a bottle of Tabasco sauce, you know how hot that is, and mix the, that together. That's hot. They put that on you. Boy, you start sweating, and boy, you're on fire. Gee. Yeah. What was your highest batting average? 378. 378. Yeah. And I never come close to leading the league. Cobb and Jackson were hitting 400. You saw Jackson play a lot. Oh, yeah. He was a real good hitter. Oh, indeed. He hit a ball harder, as hard as anybody ever hit a ball, I think. Even Babe Ruth. They claim that he hit one in the old polo ground. You've seen the polo sure. ground. Sure. Double deck. Sure. Double deck, and then the roof. He hit the old ball over the roof. Wow. You know, it's pretty good wall up to hit it in the lower pavilion, and a little better to hit it upstairs. But he hit it clear over the roof. Yeah. With the old ball. He reminded me of uh, Ted Williams. He's built it just about like Ted Williams. Long and rangy. Not muscular, but just had the natural swing. Did you ever see Mays play? Yeah, I saw him. How would you compare him to the old ball players? Oh, he'd be all right with any, any of the old timers. Wonder how Cobb would have reacted under the circumstances, because Cobb was a southerner and he always remembered he was a southerner. He never forgot it either. He always had a color boy he could uh, kick around, run his air and do things like that. I very seldom mentioned Cobb, you know, but he never had a friend in baseball. Yeah, I know. You know that. That's a terrible thing, you know. Play up there 20 years and never have a friend. That is not right. Cobb said when he first came up, you know, and he didn't get along with any of the ball players on the team. He didn't want to get along with yeah. the ball players. He came up when we were damn Yankees, you know. He led that Atlantic League down there, I think, down there in Augusta or somewhere down there. He was pretty cocky, you know. 
He said he was treated pretty rough. Yeah, but why? Well, there's two sides to this thing. Why? Why was everybody against There must have been a reason for it. They're not, we're not uh, cannibals or heathens or anything. <laughs> we're all, we're all ball players together trying to get along. And somebody comes in there and disrupts the whole situation. The damn Yankees, and things like that. He was still fighting the Civil War. Yeah, it was a terrible thing. He had a book, you know. He wrote a book. He had a book. Too much eye in there, I thought. The big star, you know, the big star. Babe Ruth was a big star. Yeah, although he's different. Babe star. Ruth was a big star, and everybody loved him. Yeah. Yeah, so like Walter Johnson, a was, was speaker, a was you know, good fellow. Todd wanted to be the whole thing, all the time, all the time. Evidently, as he got older, Cobb mellowed and was... Uh, well, he, he mellowed a bit, just so Mother Nature mellowed him, that's all. Yeah. You know, they talked to me about Cobb. I always say he was one of the greatest ball players ever. I don't think he was the greatest ball player I ever lived. I think Hannes Wagner was the greatest ball player I ever lived. But I mean, all around, ball player. Cobb could only play the outfield. Honest could play outfield, infield, anything. Could run, you know, a big bow-legged guy could run like a scared rabbit. Yeah, Steal huh? bases, hit, every throw, wonderful arm. They knew what to do. They never made a mistake. Yeah, now you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a treat, you know, to see ball players like that. You know, I saw them in their prime. Yeah. You saw some mighty good pitching, didn't yeah. you? Walter Johnson. Were you playing the day Walter Johnson first pitched his major league game? I beat him. I do not being egotistical. I, I I hit a home run off him that first day. I think we beat him three to two. First game he ever pitched in a big American race. League. You ever heard of Contillion, Joe Contillion? Sure. You know Joe? You know of him? Sure. Well, he was managed in Washington. I think that was 1907. Yeah. We were after the pennant then. That was our first pennant. But Joe was always kidding. He was a kidder, you know. And Walter had just reported, you know, from Idaho or somewhere. Joe sold us. He says we come out the bench and he says, "Well, boy, they got a big, big apple knocker. going to pitch against you guys today. You want to watch out for him? He's got a swift. He's plenty fast." You know, he told us that. And here's Walter. He's just a string of a kid. You know, I guess he was only about twenty. You know, tall, lanky. Yeah. Didn't have a curve. But he had that fastball. That's all it pitched. And we had a terrible time to beat him. And we needed that game, too. Just fastballs. This one, yeah. If it he didn't need any curve. He didn't need any curve. But Walter was a wonderful man, too. He was, uh, he wouldn't hit anybody. He was always afraid he might hit somebody. Wonderful guy. That ball was fast. Yeah, he was fast. The fastest I ever saw. He, oh, he reminded me of uh, of these, uh, you've ever seen these pitching machines? Yeah. The compressed air things? Well, I've batted against those things, and it's a peculiar thing. The batters are afraid of that machine because they could gear that thing up so that ball, boy, it was like a bullet, you know. It swished. That's the word I use, swish. Whoosh, when it went by you, see? Well, that's the kind of a ball that Walter Johnson pitched. He had a swish on it. What was Rube Bardell like back in the Western League in 1899? Oh, he was, you know, he was just like a big boy. You could take him by the hand and lead him around anywhere, you know. You see, there's a story that Connie Mack used to pay him in silver dollars, you know. They gave him a lot of silver dollars, you know, hold him down. I thought he had a lot of money. <laughs> Was he as wacky as he turned out to be later? He'd pitch a game and you wouldn't see him for a week. You don't know where he is, out playing with the kids or gone fishing or something. They'd have a game advertised for Sunday, you know, and Rube Bonnell was going to pitch. Here it comes Sunday in a pretty good, you know, little town, little bleachers and everything, packed. Where's Rube? No Rube. Well, going along, going along. Pretty soon, I uh, hear something up in the grandstand, and hear uh, people are yelling, here comes Rube, here comes Rube. We go right down through the stand, you know, and jump down in front, you know, and 
clubhouse down center field, starts to off down, cross the diamond, taking off his head. <laughs> In about five minutes, he'd come out of there, you know, and, all right, let's go. <laughs> oh, he used to get a kick out of him. Good pitcher, you know, big, raw bone, six foot two or three. But he, if you didn't say anything to him, he, he would get to, uh, what do you say that word? Laxadaisio or some, you know, he'd, uh, you know, just fooling along. If you didn't say anything to him. But if you got him mad, you know, you got, if you wrote him and got him mad, then he's, then he go to work. See? And I never forget Cobb. Cobb, <laughs> he's Cobb, you're going to bat and he say, now don't get him mad when I'm up there. Don't get him mad while I'm up <laughs> while I'm up to that. <laughs> you afraid Ruby get mad, you know. Well, we used to do everything to distract him, you know. Even Jennings, you know, the manager. Yeah. Jennings. Yes. Go to the dime store and get uh, toys, rubber snakes or jack in the box, you know, his foot jumped out. All uh, stuff like that. And he'd go on the first bait coaching line and he'd set them down, see, on the grass here. Hey, Rube, look. And Rube look over and kind of grin. You know? <laughs> <laughs> do everything to distract him from his pitching. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wouldn't, you know, those things really happened, you know. Those things really happened. It's psychological, a lot in the mind. A lot of baseballs in the mind. Yeah. It? Yeah. Were you superstitious? Not too much. Not Very, too much. The only thing is uh, I wouldn't walk under a ladder, that's all. What about on the ball field? No, not so much. I've seen a lot of them superstitious. Even butterflies flying across the field. The big red butterfly, you've seen those. Sure. They're called monarchs. Or a white butterfly, you've seen white butterflies. It means something. A red one meant something, and a white one meant something. And the manager would look out, and he said, "Boy, oh boy, oh boy, there goes a red one." <laughs> you know, things like that. They believed that stuff. You know, really believed it. A fellow named Bill Armour used to manage Cleveland. Very superstitious. You know, the bats. We used to lay the bats out. You know, and if the one was laid a little bit crooked, you know, he'd holler at the bat boy, "Hey, take that hickey out of there." You know. He'd go nuts if he saw a cross-eyed boy. Really? Oh, Jesus. We used to try to find a cross-eyed boy for a bat boy. <laughs> I said, geez, there's our bat boy. <laughs> we didn't give a damn, you know. <laughs> Bill, Bill looked look at him. Oh, God, he's having an expression on him. You think he's going to die. You know? <laughs> Get rid of him. Get rid of him. Leave him stay here, but I don't want to keep him up. Keep him out of my sight. I don't want to see him. Yeah. Oh, boy, what a superstitious guy. Gee. And we'd laugh, you know. We'd you know, get a kick out of that if we could just find a cross-eyed bad boy. <laughs> oh, boy. We had a lot of fun. How'd you feel when after, you know, you figure from 1899 to 1921, you were playing every season, right? 23 years. How did it feel, 1922, when you don't go to spring training, or you're not going to go out there and play? Well, it's just, it's, you know, you don't feel any too good about it, of course. You see the parades, you know, and all that, you, you kind of get a lump in your throat, you know.